Alrighty, I'm back with uh, Dr. Feder and Dr. Meshkin, and uh, we are reviewing another paper for you today. And the next paper is uh, a clinical research done in China, and its title is Etiology, a Key Factor for Regenerative Endodontic Treatment Outcomes. So that's interesting. Dr. Meshkin, why don't you review quickly the article for us? Sure. So this is a retrospective case series performed by Hugh and colleagues. It's titled is etiology a key factor for regenerative endodontic treatment outcomes? The authors studied the outcome of regenerative therapy in 55 cases of non-vital immature permanent teeth, of which 33 had developmental malformation and 22 had traumatic injuries. The authors found regenerative therapy to have a success rate of 93.9% in the malformation group and 90. 0.9% in the trauma group, showing no statistically significant difference. The proportion of type 1 to 3 root morphology, so better root development in the malformation group, was significantly higher than in the trauma group. The authors concluded that regenerative treatment achieved reliable outcomes regarding the healing of apical periodontitis and continued root development. They also concluded that etiology does seem to influence the outcome of regenerative treatment with malformation cases presenting with a better prognosis than trauma cases. You know, one thing I found interesting is that on one, they found in the results no statistical difference, but then in the conclusion, they said that it did make a difference. Was that something I misread? No, I saw that too. I thought that was interesting. I think that they commented that the results didn't show a significant difference in the percentage changes of root length with an apical diameter. However, the malformation group had better root morphology and they also commented that the trauma group, the patients were a lot younger and the teeth were more immature. So perhaps that you know, the age and the immaturity of the teeth play a role. Yeah, uh, how often uh, do we do regenerative procedures like Tefeta in uh, cases with malformations? Obviously, the density vaginitis is the common one. I've had, I've seen uh, and I've done a bunch of those. Not regenerative, I've done regular endos on them. I uh, haven't done any regeneration on them yet. <laughs> So what do you, what do you think? What, have been your, what has been your experience? I think it probably depends on the patient population you're working with. So um, it, over my career in one patient population, I was seeing a lot of regen post trauma. And then now in my newer clinical setting, I'm actually seeing a lot more related to malformations. So it probably just has to do with the patient population you're working with. Hmm. So what, um, what would be some of the uh, population differences that would be dealing with more malformation? Is it just random or would, uh, uh, is there a correlation? Yeah, so um, it, it's been known that um, dental malformations are higher, particularly a dens invaginatus or dens evaginatus um, in Asian populations. So if you work with a heavily Asian population, um, you will probably see this in some of your younger patients. And would you, the tooth that was most common is, would that be a pre premolar for the yes, most part? Yes, premolars. And lateral incisors and so on yeah. after that as well. Exactly. And it's typical of like a talons cusp, right? Something like that. Yes. And then the tooth that is, seems to be virgin, but it has a apical lesion, yes. right? Yes. And when you see a case like that, is your natural tendency to move on and do regeneration or to do root canal? And how do you make the distinction? Well, it depends at what point I've seen the patient. So if the patient comes to me for a consult with vital pulp tissue, which is certainly a possibility, these teeth tend to be pretty immature in a younger patient. So you might think about vital pulp therapy if there still is some vital tissue there to allow for the root to continue to form. If the pulp is completely necrotic, then we might be thinking about either regeneration or apexification. So if the tooth is really open and there's no opportunity for us to place a collar plug and actually get that apical seal with some newer biosermic material, then we are looking at regen when we have those really blunderbuss type apices. And you know, you do get some of these cases because some of the dense uh, cases are completely separate. The, 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 the middle portion is doesn't contaminate the surrounding portion. So the vital response you may get is from the surrounding pulp, correct? Whereas the middle part would be uh, just an open tube, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, will that be able to be regenerated or not? Because some of that is, isn't that also with lined with enamel coronally in density vaginatus? Yes, so I found in my experience when I'm treating these cases that um, sometimes I actually have to remove the entire abnormality for healthier tooth structure 
um, in order to get to a level of either healthy pulp tissue or adequately to bribe the canal space. So, um, Dr. Fida, why would we, you know, expect a different outcome for cases that are from trauma versus um, malformation? Yes, um, this article is interesting because it does confirm the existing literature, which supports that regeneration is more effective in cases of dental malformations as compared to traumatic dental injuries. And part of that, um, there is no real clear answer. All we can do is hypothesize. And the hypothesis is that in situations of traumatic dental injuries, it's not only the injury to the pulpal space, but to the PDL and the surrounding alveolar apparatus. Um, so baseline, there's probably less capacity for these teeth to heal well. I see, and can you maybe share what your protocol is for regenerative treatment? Yes, um, so first is appropriate case selection. Um, we have to make sure that we have an immature, permanent necrotic tooth, um, and it's a tooth that will not likely to need a post space to help with the coronal restoration. So if the tooth does need a post space, then regen might not be the best treatment modality. Um, once we've identified the appropriate patient, um, it is done over two appointments. There have been some selected case reports of regen done over a single visit, but these tend to be less effective because we're not following the established protocol of the American Association of Endodontists. Um, so the first appointment is all about canal disinfection. So rubber dam isolation, removing the contaminated pulpal tissue, the necrotic pulp tissue, and minimal debridement because these teeth tend to be very immature. So we don't wanna take rotaries and potentially damage the dentin walls further. So uh, obtain a working length, um, disinfect the canal with irrigation with sodium hypochlorite, um, ideally using a diluted concentration so we can protect the apical stem cells, um, and then placing either a triple antibiotic or calcium hydroxide paste and allowing for either pain or swelling or whatever symptoms might have presented to resolve. Then having the patient back for a second appointment to remove your intracanal medicament, the, either the triple antibiotics or the calcium hydroxide. We then take a file um, and insert it past the apex, stimulate that apical area and allow for blood to fill the canal space. That blood clot um, is our scaffold from which the tooth will then regenerate. We place a bioceramic material um, in the CEJ area and then restore with our permanent restoration, which is usually composite or some form of glass ionomer. Can you maybe also share how you decide um, which intracanal medicament you will use, whether it's the triple antibiotic paste or the calcium hydroxide? Yes, I think there's been a lot of um, swinging of the pendulum, you know, from calcium hydroxide to triple antibiotic paste, back to calcium hydroxide, and there might even be newer research to support using triple antibiotic paste again. Um, some things to consider are the ease of getting the antibiotics. So oftentimes you have to get it from a compounding pharmacy versus compounding the medications yourself. Um, there are concerns and questions with potentially antibiotic resistance in these cases. And then also some antibiotics are known to stain. So if we're doing regeneration on an anterior tooth, we might not want to use triple antibiotics um, for risk of staining the tooth structure. Calcium hydroxide seems to be equally effective. Um, and it, for a lot of practitioners, it might just be the easier intracanal medicament to use. Yeah, I think I learned that the hard way. I was in one of the first groups who tried to use the triple antibiotic paste, only to find out that I did manage actually to, to, to revitalize this poor young kid's uh, anterior tooth, except that he couldn't smile anymore <laughs> after that because of the, at that time, the, um, was it the, the I think the minocycline that we had in there. The minocycline was causing the staining and uh, it actually ended up being pretty, <laughs> pretty dark afterwards. Uh, but let, let me ask you this. Do you feel like there is a difference in terms of how long the tooth has been infected as to the prognosis in terms of, you know, how well established the biofilm that is already there mm -hmm. would be there, which would then mean that if you're not doing instrumentation, you know, to physically remove the infected dentin, is a non-instrumentation technique would be adequate enough to remove deeper layers of biofilm. Mm -hmm. Could that be a factor in success? Yes, absolutely. We already have research that suggests if we don't have appropriate canal disinfection, then regeneration is going to fail. So that's related to a persistent biofilm. So how do we actually remove that biofilm? Um, by using irrigant activation is one way to do it. And then the other way is to make sure that we're actually opening the canal appropriately. In our you know, days of conservative endodontic access, we want to preserve tooth structure. But sometimes in these cases, the pulp canal space and the pulp chamber is already so large to begin with, we have to have an accurate and adequate um, canal access in order to remove that pulpal tissue. And one place that I find we tend to miss pulpal tissue is sometimes under that palatal 
dentin shelf, we really need to open up that palatal um, dentin so we can clearly see down the entire tooth structure. Yeah, I mean, there have been studies uh, done, and that's part of the reason why I am not a fan of these minimally invasive access preparations, because they not only restrict instrumentation, but also these studies have shown that they, they do leave under the pulp horns, and as you said, under the cingulum and the, the digital ridge, a whole bunch of biofilm that, especially in the case of regeneration, it's so dependent on uh, the antimicrobial or disinfection uh, techniques that we would have, it would cause um, problems. And that's actually the, the key part. Since regenerative treatments, in my opinion, my view, and I think that's pretty much the current consensus, is primarily dependent on the antimicrobial quality of the treatment, because it would fail if there is antigens left behind, and it wouldn't fail if there was a magical way we could just, you know, throw a, you know, I don't know, some type of a gamma ray thing and just this, this completely sterilize the whole thing. And what are we doing to address that? I mean, the triple antibiotic base, as you said, and the calcium hydroxide is the thing we're going back and forth on, as well as the activation of the irrigation. But could that just be the only thing here and that we're just maybe chasing the wrong end of these materials and so on? The real key here is just our inability to completely get rid of the antigens. Yes, and I think one thing that's also missing is the, the opportunity and ability to really target and understand a patient's own immune response. Because in some patients, you know, we can do a pretty bad root canal and they heal and everything is wonderful. In other, other patients, we do our best job, rubber dam isolation, appropriate disinfection, and for whatever reason, that patient is still, you know, symptomatic and infection does persist. So there is that missing piece of personalized medicine. Um, how we actually get to that in the field of regen, I'm not sure, but I think that is one thing that we, we really need to think about. Actually, this month, JOE, on this uh, article on ra diabetes-induced rats and their rate of bone healing, which is true, because, I mean, as we know, diabetes is, is uh, affects neutrophils, macrophages, and so on, and so the, the, that, that does cause a problem with the immune system. Uh, any of these systemic factors. So Dr. Fida, does the complexity of the anatomy of the tooth um, contribute to the outcome? Absolutely. Um, for single-rooted teeth, it's much easier for us to provide appropriate canal disinfection. We can visualize that canal space better with our microscope. Um, we can use irrigant activation. Um, however, in the case of a molar, where we might not be able to visualize as well. There may be isthmuses, um, the canal anatomy may be a little bit unusual. We may not be able to get our disinfectant down into the tooth as well as we would like. Um, and it, it kind of goes along with the prognosis of the endodontic literature in general, where anterior teeth tend to have a better success rate as compared to posterior teeth or multi-rooted teeth. Yeah, anytime we end up having a complex anatomy, there's more room for antigens, microbes, and things like that too. To, to kind of stay in and as, as you know, with a regular obturation, you have a chance because you could entomb them. Yeah. As long as they don't get out, that's not a problem. But with regeneration, you are gonna have cells in contact with them. It's gonna create an immune response. So therefore, you, you just have to have a tremendously higher level of disinfection for regeneration, bordering on sterilization compared to uh, prosthetic replacement of the pulp with a, uh, with a root canal filling material which probably is why regenerative therapies are still gonna have their limitations in the foreseeable future. Would you agree with that statement? Yes, I would agree. And um, despite the challenges with regeneration in multi-rooted teeth, I would still attempt it, especially in a young patient. Again, thinking about growth and development, maintaining the alveolar bone, the patient's inability to tolerate an implant or having a final prosthetic plan. I mean, there have been several cases that I have attempted regeneration on molar teeth as a way to buy some time until a final plan is thought for that patient. That's interesting. So you would think that that would still buying some time as even if there is a lower grade of infection, lower level of infection at that critical concentration of SAMP cell Hendry used to call it, uh, that would allow still at least the epithelial root sheet and the end of the root formation to complete that, that yes. can happen. Yes, in an ideal world with appropriate disinfection, you might not get entire root formation and entire root length and thickness, and we may not have, um, we may not regain the pulp vitality, but it is an opportunity to remove the infection, allow the bone to potentially heal, and let the patient grow and development, grow and develop, see what happens with the alveolus, figure out an orthodontic plan, and at least get them through a few years of 
uh, um, jaw formation. Exactly. I mean, the whole point here is that, especially in thinner blender bus APCs and thinner roots, is can we get a little bit more girth and a little bit more meat onto the roots so that they can not fail so quickly in chewing function. So I think that's great. Another great article that you mentioned, thanks for this, uh, Joyce. Let's get the, to the third article, which would be about the long-term outcomes of endodontically treated traumatized immature upper incisors. All right, we'll come back in the next video for that.